to my channel. So today's actually going to be my last in the serial killer mini series. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to be doing more because trust me, I have a lot more planned for the future. But it is the end of the month, and because I'm kind of already a week off, I wanted to just go ahead and take February to do kind of a recap of all the different mini series I've done. Expect to see a solved case, expect to see a Jane or a John Doe, maybe another serial killer. Basically, all the things I've already done, I'm just going to throw on into next month, and then we're going to start with a new, fresh mini series in March. So, I want to go ahead really quickly and give a huge shout out to a couple of subscribers subscribers that helped me in this video. Um, I'm not sure if you want your names out there, so I am not going to be using them, but I do have two different subscribers from Russia that helped me figure out pronunciation for a couple of these things and helped me have access to a couple of articles that I needed for information. So huge thank you to you guys. So today's video is on a current serial killer, which is something I said I wasn't going to do, but he's already technically serving life in prison and he's only adding to his case as we speak, and that's the serial killer Mikhail Popkov, and he's also known as the werewolf and might possibly be Russia's very worst serial killer. Mikhail Popkov has killed possibly 81 women. They are still trying to fully prove, I think, the very last dozen. I'm obviously going to be getting into all of the details in the video, and he did this between the years of 1992 and 2010 in... Here we go. I'm going to try to pronounce these things right. Angarsk, Irkutsk, and Vladivostok in Siberia. If you are the one on Snapchat that taught me how to say those and I said them right, please let me know because I felt so silly just saying them. This is where his story begins. Mikhail was born on March 7th, 1964, and there's not really a lot of backstory on his life. You know, what he was like when he was younger. All we really know is that he worked as a policeman up until he resigned in 1998, where he then went to work as a security guard. And this whole time, he had a wife that absolutely adored him and a daughter who thought the most of him. It was initially believed that he killed 22 women between the years of 1992 and 2000. And he says that these killings were triggered by the fact that his wife might have possibly cheated on him. Now he wouldn't really go into much detail about why he thought this. There are different articles saying that she said this wasn't true. Then there's other articles saying she came forward and said it was. But just the thought of this happening alone is apparently what triggered him to go into his mass killing spree. He had a very particular MO, and in my opinion, a very stupid one, which is interesting because of how long he managed to get away with it. He would dress in his cop uniform, take his cop car out, and drive around the streets late at night in all of these different cities and possibly cities even further out from where he lived. And he would lure in intoxicated women or really any woman that he possibly could that would get into the car with him. Sometimes he would offer to take these women home, just a simple lift by your friendly police officer, or he would offer to take some of them out for a drink. Um, sometimes he was a little bit sexually enticing and would try to promise them different things and be flirty and... It was all pretty much one setup, and while he promised a lot of this stuff, that is never usually what actually happened. Since he thought his wife was cheating on him, he developed this very deep anger towards women that just threw themselves at men. So he made it his task to clean up the streets of things like prostitutes and immoral women. Despite the fact that he made a majority of these women trust him because he was wearing his police uniform and offered them a safe ride home in what might have otherwise been an unsafe situation, he claimed that any woman that was wandering around the streets at night intoxicated or unaccompanied by a man, a woman who would so easily get into the car of another man or have a conversation with another man that she didn't know, was basically deserving of what would later happen to them. He claimed that they were completely careless and basically subjected themselves to this sort of activity. While there were women that he claimed he would see better morals in and let free, he claimed that there was a very distinct behavior by some that made them seem promiscuous, I guess you would say, he and those were the ones that never made it back home. He would take these women and drive them out to the forest, where he would kill them using multiple different methods. And the most 
absurd and terrifying thing about this is that every murder weapon was one taken from the police department's arsenal of confiscated weapons from actual criminals. So he had basically a giant room of tools for his killing that he just had readily available to him as a police officer. Now, it was always something very, very personal because of the fact that this whole situation was kind of personal because it had to do with his wife. He would stab women, he would ax them, he would brutally sexually assault them before and after death. There are many, many descriptions online that were just a bit too graphic for me to get into, but he did some horrifying things to these women. There were many allegations that he strangled these women or shot them. There was even one tale out there, and I'm calling it tale because I'm pretty sure it's an inflated media story at this point, that said that he cut out one victim's heart. Since I haven't seen it proven, all of those methods were pretty much ruled out. But because of how brutal these killings were, stories like that started popping up everywhere of different crazy things he did, along with the name that was given to him, which was the werewolf. Now, he was originally dubbed the Wednesday Murderer because when these bodies started popping up, it seemed to be Wednesday mornings that they would be found. However, one particular detective that was trying desperately to hunt this killer down deemed him the werewolf, and that is the name he's now stuck with. Popkoff managed to go a very long time without being questioned by anyone. So far, police were being just run in circles. There was never any evidence left behind because all of these items that had been taken from the confiscated room from the police department, you know, he knew what he was doing. He was a police officer. He wiped them clean, made sure there was nothing of him left behind, and disposed of them somewhere near the body. There was no way to link any of these weapons to him because he didn't buy them himself, and they did at one point belong to other criminals, so who would you link them to? Probably the other criminals. He was incredibly intelligent. His wife knew nothing, his daughter knew nothing, and I will get further into that later, but he really was leading a complete double life, which reminds me a lot, a lot of the H.H. Holmes situation where there's a family that thinks everything is completely fine, but he somehow manages to do such horrific things in his free time. It's mind-boggling, honestly. However, one of Popkov's victims managed to survive. I think there was like a total of possibly three, two or three that survived. Again, because I have very limited access to Russian information, I wasn't able to confirm this. Um, it said that some victims were found and taken to the hospital, but I only found one for sure record of one, and her name was Svetlana, and she was only 15 years old. Svetlana told police that she was approached by a policeman in his police car and offered a ride home. She happily accepted, however, again, as we know, Popkov, this was not his actual plan. Instead, he led her to the woods, stripped her down, smashed her head against a tree, which made her fall unconscious, and no one really knows what he did to her after that, but he must have thought she was dead because he left without double checking. No one knows how she managed to survive this attack. It was below zero outside and she was completely naked and was out there for over 12 hours. People normally would have died within a few hours from hypothermia, but something kept this girl alive. Someone found her and took her to the hospital where she woke up and was able to tell her story to police. However, police seemed to be ignoring the vital information she was giving them. She was even able to 100% identify Popkov as her attacker. But I feel like at this point, police were in denial that one of their own was the one behind these attacks. They'd already spent so much time trying to put all the puzzle pieces together. They thought the attacker of all these women was a metal worker, someone just impersonating an officer, a driver, a railway employee, all these things, because if you think about it, why would you choose to approach these people in your uniform, in the car, of your actual profession? To police, it seemed more likely that it was just a fraud. 
But then the police station got a lot of criticism for not taking what this girl said seriously. She was a 15 year old girl who was brutally attacked and somehow by some miracle managed to survive it. And it possibly gave them a chance to finally nail down this killer. This had otherwise been a decently safe area and all of a sudden all these women were just literally disappearing into thin air from a public place, which is not a very common thing to happen. They finally decided to question Popkov and Interestingly enough, his wife gave him an alibi. Now, I don't know exactly what she said they were doing or why she did this because in the end, we find out that she had no idea this was going on, but she did. She somehow managed to give him an alibi, so they immediately took their attention away from him but only for it to be brought back almost immediately. Another victim showed up and one of the largest things that they knew about this victim was that she had an STD and Shortly after they found her and discovered this bit of information, it was realized by police that Popkov had the same STD. Now they questioned him again about this, they questioned his wife again, who by the way was also in the police department, and she again gave him an alibi. I'm not sure what exactly was going through her mind when, you know, her husband was questioned once for possibly trying to murder one young girl um, and you know she obviously was not with him because he was in fact the one who did it so why would she automatically cover for him and at the same time I mean imagine how she felt the second time when her husband was found to have an STD that another one of the victims ended up having and she still gave him an alibi knowing again that she had nothing to do with it. I just think that's so crazy and that she never really questioned anything, at least that we know of. During this time, victims just kept adding up to a young woman named Tanya and Yulia had been going to a concert and afterwards they went to grab a few drinks. While leaving the bar, they were offered a safe ride home from a cop and unfortunately a few days later, both of their bodies were found in a village close to Engarsk and it was horrifying the state in which their bodies were found. They both were horrifically mutilated and one of the sisters, it was Tanya's sister, felt absolutely heartbroken because she was the one who had given her these tickets. You know, she felt like it was her fault and then she unfortunately would later even find out once Popkov was eventually arrested for her murder that she knew Popkov. She was familiar with him. They went to the same sports center. Imagine Imagine that. Just imagine having seen your sister's killer face to face, possibly before and after her murder, and not knowing it. Another young woman named Maria was 20 years old and worked at a water pumping station. She was found murdered in the forest a few days after her disappearance on the 17th of August in 1999. Just days before this, another woman was found in roughly the same area with multiple stab wounds and she had been decapitated. A little while after Maria was found, that first curl's head was found in a trash can in a completely different district. It was just a level of mutilation that a lot of people had not seen before. A lot of the places the bodies were dumped were relatively close to each other. It was just horrific to a lot of people who lived in the area and Russian tradition is to have an open casket service and a burial because it gives relatives and loved ones a chance to say their final goodbyes. Despite how strong those traditions were, almost all of these people had to be buried closed casket because of how horribly he mutilated their bodies. Two more victims, Marina and Lilia, had gone to visit one of their sisters at a shop. They hung out for a few hours one night and then around midnight they decided to head home. They called a taxi but it was beautiful that night and they figured what better thing to do after having such a great day, such a great night together. Let's just walk home and the beautiful summer night. But what started off as a beautiful, relaxed walk in the night ended horrifically. And Popkov offered them a ride and they were both brutally murdered and each of them had children. They both were just average women enjoying a night walk home. Finally, on June 23rd, 2012, almost after 20 years of killing, he was arrested. Police in the area decided to relook into all of these different cases and try to find a connection again because before they just weren't quite getting it. For some reason, they decided to DNA test around, I think it was 3,500 people from the police department, including Popkov. 
They also realized when looking back at pictures from the crime scenes that the same tire marks were seen beside most of the bodies in every single crime scene. So then they started their search for a car that had the same, I guess, tires, tracks, um, pattern. I'm not really sure what exactly they were looking for. And interestingly enough, that same exact time that they were searching for this car, Popkov went to buy himself a new one. And this is when they arrested him. Popkov felt not even a single bit of remorse, period. He did not feel bad for what he did. He didn't even try to hide any of it. He even told the officers that were interrogating him at first that you know, he never expected DNA technology to catch up. He said he was born in a different century and he never really thought there would be any way to link him. He said that he was a police officer and based off where DNA testing was at that point, you know, it pretty much didn't exist. Said that was the only reason that they found him. He was basically just antagonizing these cops and being like, you got lucky, it's not because you're smart, it's because someone just so happened to get DNA testing up and going fast enough. Popkov told police that his first murder was even spontaneous, that it was all because of his wife, but he was, you know, at first just being a good citizen. He did. He offered to take a woman home, and in the middle of driving her home, he said, and I quote, I just felt like I wanted to kill a woman I was giving a lift to in my car. So out of nowhere, he just decided he wanted to kill this woman, and that's pretty much where it all began. He said that after he killed her and not a single person was even remotely close to finding out it was him, keep in mind, he was in the police department. He knew how close they were getting. He said that it gave him no fear, that it took every ounce of fear of killing someone away from him because he realized exactly how easy it was to get away with murder. He eventually led police to his crime scenes and where the remaining victims were buried, where their bodies were being kept. He was very cooperative the entire time and fully admitted to 22 murders, all of his victims between the ages of 17 and 40. However, despite his idea that he was cleaning up the city, almost all of them were just average women. Yes, I think there were a few prostitutes in there, but as I said before, two young girls just went to a concert to have a fun night out. Two moms were just taking a summer walk home one night. A lot of these victims did absolutely nothing but trust a police officer, but his state of mind was so discombobulated because he was so angry at his wife that it didn't matter. He didn't realize these people trusted him only because he was a cop. All he saw was this woman throwing themselves at him, and that led him to kill a ton of people that did nothing wrong. He was officially charged on October 31st, 2013, and sentenced to life in prison where he then would go on to admit to 59 more murders, bringing it to a total of 81 women murdered, which would, if they all were positively identified, make him Russia's worst serial killer, and I think in the top three worst serial killers in the world with the most actual proven kills. So he would be hands down, one of the worst serial killers. He was immediately charged with 47 of those murders and the other dozen, I think right now, are even still being investigated to try to 100% pin them to him, but officers are pretty sure. He was so incredibly specific, I'm talking exactly where wounds were on the body, I mean every bit of information of what he did to the woman, where exactly their body was, where he picked them up, and it's probably one of the only reasons they've been able to confirm 100% so many of his murders. This isn't like other serial killers, for instance last week, again, H.H. H. Holmes, even Belle Gunness, my very first video where, oh, well, you know, they possibly could have done it, but there's no real way to link it. Like, he knew everything and he was just an open book about it. However, he had told police that he had stopped his killings in 2000 before he admitted to these 59 new murders. Now, he said when he got this STD from this other victim, he didn't want to go about his killings anymore, but this new bit of information, these new people that were confirmed, moved the time frame from killing stopping in 2000 to stopping in 2010, which is just a few years before he was caught. And this has brought police to their most recent idea that he's killed way, way, 
way more than 81 women. Police think that he is just rationing the bits of information that he is giving to them. He gave them just a little bit at first and once he was charged with that and put into prison, he admitted to a little bit more and that meant him going back to just a detention facility until they could really finally figure out what was going on and how many exactly. So police think he's just rationing everything so he doesn't have to go to jail right away. They think it's possible that he traveled a lot further to other different villages that they haven't had a chance to look into yet. At this point, they're really not ruling anything out because he seems to be making it a game. While he was in jail, he was actually interviewed for a TV show and it was extremely, extremely unsettling. He was smiling the entire time. He seemed so happy to be in the spotlight and have the attention on him. He was soaking it up. This infuriated absolutely everyone watching the show and created a huge amount of backlash, especially because he pretty much mocked his victims in this interview and said that he hopes to one day be out and free again. And he also said that all of the sexual encounters were completely consensual, which goes against a lot of the things that they found. And it infuriated everyone to the point that there was an online Storm for Putin to end the moratorium on the death penalty and take things back to more traditional Russian methods of shooting the person at a very close range. So that's how angry it made people. They wanted the death penalty back and not just life in prison and they wanted him shot basically at point blank because of the crimes he committed. However, I don't think that happened. I'm actually pretty sure he's standing trial right now. Now, I don't know what the outcome is and I'm hoping a lot of my Russian family out there will help me keep updated on that because I cannot find anything on the current trial of the 59 other women. So I'm interested to see if they will actually have the death penalty for him or if they will just keep it at life in prison. His wife and daughter have since moved away to a different city. His daughter is grown up at this point. She's a teacher living her own life, but neither one of them still fully believe he is responsible for these murders. Like I said before, he seemed to lead a double life. I even have a quote from him where he says, in one life I was an ordinary person. In my other life I committed murders which I carefully concealed from everyone realizing that this was a criminal offense. So he went to extreme lengths to make sure that no one had any idea, especially his family. Obviously, if you're going to go murder, you know, almost a hundred people, you don't want people to probably know that. So it's been incredibly, incredibly challenging for his family to deal with. Imagine someone that you love and care about and that you know loves and cares about you back. Like, you have that connection, you have that bond, that's your father, that is your husband, that's who you love. They've never ever done you any harm. And then imagine knowing the amount of harm they could do to someone else. You know, even knowing that, that has to be difficult to cope with because they never showed any signs of that towards you. I don't know, I don't even know how I'd feel in that situation and my heart goes out to both of them because that has to be incredibly challenging to deal with. His daughter has even said, he never came home covered in blood. He never came home covered in scratches or bruises. Did these women just lie down and let him do this? I doubt it, so why doesn't he have anything showing that these women fought back if he killed brutally so many women? I thought you guys would really be interested in this story because I've done very, very old cases so far. I tried to do something a little bit newer that maybe wasn't as life-threatening as someone still out there on the run and he's in Russia, he's very far away. I feel quite safe about the situation. He's also in a prison, so I thought this was so fascinating and one of you guys actually suggested him to me and I stumbled across him and I just couldn't help but thinking how absolutely crazy his story is and you know, the fact that he knew exactly what to do and did not care at all when he was caught. He showed no remorse, period, and Imagine feeling like that. Well, I guess not 
feeling like that technically. That is just crazy to me. So let me know what you guys think down below. I want to know, as strange as this sounds, what your favorite serial killer was in this mini series. I hope you guys enjoyed it. The topic of serial killers has been one that's been suggested to me for months now, like probably since I started this channel. So I hope you guys enjoyed this mini series and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, give this video a huge thumbs up. It helps me so, so, so much. Tell me what other serial killers you would like for me to possibly cover in the future. Hit that subscribe button to become a member of our family and I'll see you in my next video. Bye guys.